good morning um, to our viewers and participants from all over the world. This is Greater Works. This is the um, ninth installment in the 13 week, uh, 13 week um, um, series. Uh, if you recall, last week we talked about uh, new data protection regulation is a church compliant. Uh, but today we are moving a bit forward to something very interesting uh, to more, many parents. And we're talking teenagers. And we'll be talking about social media engagement with your team. Uh, as you know, that um, the team here, or what I call teenagers, are actually the, uh, I'll call them special um, age group, where parents sometimes they, uh, they get very uneasy because of their, their peculiarity. However, I'd just like to walk you through what Greater Works is. Greater Works is a, an engagement platform for Christian influencers, thought leaders, and strategic thinkers who are passionate about expressing themselves and sharing their thoughts and how the church um, can shape culture, ecologically, politically, economically, and socially. And therefore, we, we bring in people who are, um, as, as it were, high rates in their spaces, whether technology, parent, and parenting, or, or, or whatever, in every sphere of life. Last week, we did. Um, we did. We did have. We did have uh, Mrs. Biola last day and uh, Yimi Kaketiko. Both are lawyers, and they shared their thoughts on the new data regulation. Is your church compliant? And it, and the, the the fulcrum of our discussion was that it is the right of the data subject, that is you and I, to protect our data, and also the data controllers, which are the maybe churches and the ministry, have some limit as well. They have some rights as well. That said, we're moving on. On today's Greater Work series, we have, it's a pleasure and honor to have Ben Gashoso. Ben is the executive director of Paradigm Initiative, a pan African social enterprise working on digital inclusion and digital rights through its offices in Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, Tanzania, and, and, and Zambia. He's a non resident, non -resident fellow at the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford University. And prior to starting digital. Starting Paradigm Initiative, Benga led Lagos Digital Village, a joint project of junior achievement of Nigeria, Microsoft, and Lagos State Government. Originally trained as an electrical, 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 electric engineer at Obafemi Awolo University. He completed the executive education program at Lagos Business School, New York Group for Technology Transfer, Oxford University, Harvard University, Stanford University, Santa Clara University. And the list is extremely long. Um, is a Archbishop of Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellow, Ashoka Fellow, uh, is, is, a, is a committee on harmonization of information technology, te te telecommunications, and broadcasting sectors, and also uh, a roadmap for the achievement of accelerated universal broadband infrastructure and services provision. Um, it's been listed as by CNN as one of the top 10 African tech voices on Twitter. Um, Wenger is happily married to Timilade Shesso, an PhD and expert on energy poverty and development. You're welcome, Mr. Wenger Shesso. Thank you for having me. A pleasure, sir. I also have uh, Mrs. Victoria Oluwani. Um, she's a Fellow of the Institute of Channel Accountants of Nigeria and a member of the Society of Women Accountants of Nigeria. She's also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria and an alumnus of China Europe International Business School, one of the top five business schools in the world. Oluwani is a serial entrepreneur. She's run so many businesses, uh, especially which spans oil and gas and basic, and basic distribution. Prior to this, she's worked with Noble Greeley Nigeria Limited. West African Division of Noble Corporation, Houston, Texas, as the stand controller finance for the division. Mrs. Victoria Oluwani, you're welcome to Greater Works. Okay, it's actually a pleasure to have um, both of them. I'm going to be calling them Mrs. Auntie Vicky. But, right, but, but let, let me just ask um, Mr. Ben Gashesso. I want to just give me an impression of your. Um, because when I, when I was going through your profile, I, I, do, I do understand that you actually won a, a competition in your team, a, tech, a, a, a technology uh, 
competition in your team. I want to just just give me a background to like um, the, your, the team in your own days and the teenagers we have them now. Can you just give us just give us like a background? Okay, so I mean, I I, I won that competition at, at 23, so I wasn't exactly 18, but um, of course okay. the foundation. Uh, yeah, the foundation that was laid clearly, uh, you know, when I was a teenager is clearly responsible for that. And I'm not a fan of comparing the good old days with now. Uh, and the reason is very obvious, uh, because the tool and the exposure that generation is very different, uh, but very, you know, clearly right now we have a lot more opportunities in terms of, you know, uh, the Internet, which of course didn't exist. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, but I think one one very clear thing that I must say is that some you know two key things that are very relevant then and now. Uh, number one is drive, uh, and when I say drive, I mean that you must be driven. You cannot afford to be mediocre, to be like the rest, and wait for you know people to tell you what to do. Uh, you move from year one to year two, three, and you just cram past and forget and continue. But you have to be driven. There has to be a sense of being uh, for you as a person. And I think the second thing is also to expose yourself to as much knowledge that can take you in the direction of your dreams. Uh, that can be through friends. It can be through, it can be through mentors that uh, you approach. But, you know, it's very critical that in addition to drive, you also make sure that you subject yourself to a lot of exposure that can take you in the direction uh, that you would like to go. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I, 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 th thank you very much, sir. But research has shown that the brain of the young person is not as, is not really so adverse, and so sometimes they tend to be clumsy. Uh, they tend to be they tend to behave, um, uh, would I say, immaturely, which is actually expected. But I also think that parents sometimes put too much too, too much pressure on them right? because they do they, they expect them, for example. When you, ask, when you enter your, your team's room, you expect her to update to be made up, you expect her to lace her shoes properly. But research has shown that their brain is not really, really well formed until they get to their 20s. But parents do put a lot of pressure on them. What do you say to this, sir? Um, so, you know, the, uh, as a parent of two kids myself, a uh, five, five year old who okay. actually is a parent of What That's him. And, and a two-year-old, uh, five and two, okay. and and you know, so I I can understand um, as as a child who then becomes a parent, I can understand why parents are tempted uh, to expect perfection uh, from teenagers and from kids generally. And the reason for that is because uh, don't forget when you were in primary one and they told you, or when you were, yeah, when they, you were in, you know, elementary school, when they told you at some point that one minus two was impossible, uh, you understood it was impossible. And then you go to primary six, or you go to just one, you realize that one minus two was minus one. It was no longer impossible. At that point that you have learned that it is no longer, you know, it's no longer impossible, you honestly forget the stage where it was impossible for you. So if they ask you one minus two, instinctively you say minus one. Now, if somebody says impossible, you can't relate with what they're saying. You're like, why are you so dumb? It's minus one. Now that's what happens to parents. We're now mature and we project our maturity on the children and expect them to be as mature as we are. Uh, and, and by the way, this is what every parent, including myself, this is what we go through. We need to constantly remind ourselves that these are children. I mean, I told you my son is five, right? For a five-year-old, at times I expect too much from him. Uh, so he's at piano practice right now. And so if you hear any piano in the background, that's my son, right? You know, and, sure. and you know, he has these pieces to play and all that. And when he, you know, moves away from playing and wants to play and just be a five-year-old, at times I'm like, stop it, be serious. Uh, and the reason for that is because I'm at one minus two is minus one stage. He wants okay. to be at one minus was impossible. Uh, and, and I think it, it's very important for us to remember that as parents, uh, these are kids. Uh, when they become teenagers, we need to put ourselves in our shoes. When we we're teenagers, don't forget, the teenage years are the years that you literally fight to find an identity. That's when you find 
to define your core values. As a teenager, I was exposed to a lot, and that was when I decided the path for my life. Either I knew it or I wrote it down or not. That was the time. So when we see and listen to teenagers, we need to, uh, and the two things that obviously help, you know, even with my five-year-old, uh, one is empathy. You know, putting yourself in his shoes and realizing, honestly, at five, I didn't play one chord of the piano. And so I should appreciate what this guy is doing right now. Uh, and I think secondly is also there's a level of interaction you can't have with a five year old, uh, but that he sees and appreciates that at least that is listening. OK, uh, and, and even much more for teenagers. I mean, I've never had a teenager, uh, but when I talk to teenagers, you know, in counseling or in training, I realize that even listening to them and admitting and you know acknowledging their existence gives them a lot of boost and helps them to listen you know a lot more so i think we need a lot of empathy uh, i mean ironically this is not something i of course we should be telling parents because parents should know thank you very much now i just i just i just asked mr mr Chesso, um some questions i'm going to just ask you in another way i'm talking about uh parents um i'm expecting too much from the, from your team the way I'm going to ask you is this. What do you, you know, he said from the while, while responding, he said most teenagers, they tend to want to find their identity during the teen years, you know, teen years. However, um, I, want to just, I want to just ask you, parents don't find it very easy, you know, because in finding their identity, to some, to some extent, they tend to be rebellious. They flash your rules. They... Uh, if some, some of the, some of the, you know, they, you, you can't really now tell them sit down, you know, get up, go and go there. No, they, they can, they can push back, you know. So how do you think parents can actually navigate this terrain between thirteen and seventeen? Thank you very much. Um, I've always say that um, skyscrapers are not built in a day. We don't prophesy. Um, you don't prophesy a building to just show up, you know. Every, every relationship must be built, must be worked at, must be, um, 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 must be intentional about it. Now, everything starts from when the child is young. As long as you can have a, a, a good close relationship with your child from when they when they are growing up it will help you in their teenage years you know there's a scripture that says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of god what you hear all the time as a child sometimes haunt you and haunt you everywhere you go um we're from a home as in in in, in the in the church where some words some values have been put into us so even even when you come to that age of oh I want to do my thing myself because one major problem with teenagers is identity crisis. I want to I want to take my decisions. I want to do all that because of what they have heard from when they are younger and the relationship you have you have built with them from when they were younger till that particular time. It will help them most of the time. They will remember and um, they won't. They, even though they want to be rebellious, kind of they will still know that, no, I can't cross this boundary because there's this, there's this um, values, there's this um, instruction, there's this uh, uh, um, activities that we have had together when we were younger. And so they kind of go back to it and they remember it. So I, I think um, that will help <laughs> so that we as parents don't just react to them. We need to at all times respond to them as appropriate. Okay, so we need to be very careful. We need to be deliberate. We need to be intentional with our expectations with these, uh, with these teenagers. So if we have already cultivated the habit of spending appropriate time with them before now, it won't be um, difficult to win them over again, um, even at this stage um, of their lives that they, they, they get into as teenagers. Thank you. Thank, th thank you very much. I'm going to come to um, Sushasa. Now, let's talk social media a little bit. I know you're a tech, you're um, a tech printer. The way teenagers use social media and the internet, you know, as a language, just as an addendum, as an addendum rather, 
The point is, um, studies have shown that 95% of teenagers have access to a smartphone, and they are on smart uh, on, snap, uh, on Snapchat, they're on Instagram, they're on lots of them, a, a few, few number of them are on Facebook. I want to ask, the engagement with the social media, they tend to spend more time with the social media than they even spend with their family. How yeah. can parents help them? So a few things uh, that I've seen uh, as a parent and also as a mentor to teenagers uh, is number one, you need to understand what you want to anyway. You do not understand the platforms they are on, and you do not know how those platforms work. It is impossible for you to have conversations about those platforms with them. So I think it's important for parents uh, to understand that this is the digital era you have no choice you have to at least understand and i'm not saying that every you know parent should know uh should have a TikTok account i mean i do uh for obvious reasons uh regardless of how fringe the platform is i have accounts um not only because i want to protect my digital identity but also because I want to understand and be on the cutting edge of what's going on. But for me, it's, it's my work, it's research, right? Uh, but parents must understand this platform. Uh, it's, it's, it's a typical parenting, uh, you know, uh, skill that you have, right? With them, uh, when it's time to talk about sex, you talk about sex with them, and you don't allow them to go and hear about sex from outside from their friends who have a perfect, you know, a best understanding of, of, of sex. It's the same thing with you have to have that conversation with them. By the way, there's a reason why 13 is the minimum age for most social media platforms. It's because that is the age of digital consent. Now, don't forget, the age of digital consent is much less than the age of physical consent. The age of physical content, consent is 18 or 21, depending on the country you're in, but the age of digital consent is 13. That's the point where you can and say, uh, I approve that my data can be collected, I approve that I want to use this platform. So I think it's important for parents, number one, to understand these platforms. Number two, to once in a while use these platforms with them. And number three is to help them define an agenda for why they're on that social media platform. One of the things that I've learned, not just for teenagers, but also for adults, is that many people get on platforms because they're, uh, they're cool and they're new. Because it's cool and because it's new, you will be swept away with the, you know, with the flood of everything that happens there. But if you are on that platform for a purpose, if you're there to, of course, entertainment is part of it, but if you're there because you want to learn, if you're there because you want to share information, it becomes a lot more useful for you. People say things like, oh, Twitter is toxic. Twitter is an misunderstood place, blah, blah, blah. I'm on Twitter. I use Twitter effectively, and I will not get off Twitter because people are saying, oh, it's a bad place. People are only talking about bad things there because of my approach and my use is very different. So I think these are the three key things. Number one is parents must understand these platforms. Guess what? The kids understand it already. You don't have to teach them. They understand it already. The second is you need to use it with them. It's like watching uh, TV. There's parental control and all that, but even with parental controls, there are still TV programs that you need to discuss with your kids. You need to speak with them and explain to them because their worldview is narrow. Their worldview is limited by what they've been exposed to. Do you understand? Uh, suddenly, there's a there's a whole talk about George Floyd around the world, and your son, who is an says. Uh, or your daughter says, oh, mommy or daddy, uh, why is everyone talking about George Floyd and things like that? You need to understand the issues you need to discuss with them. And I think even more importantly is the fact that you have to take advantage of the opportunity you have as a parent to guide them. And of course, you must be readily available for the moments when uh, they make mistakes, they do the wrong things to walk them through it and make them realize that this is the reason why you should choose A uh, over B. And by the way, for many social media platforms, if the first thing I said, which is understand the platform, if you've already done that, then you will know there are many ways that you can actually uh, manage those platforms with your kids so that you know they don't misuse it. Uh, one of the interesting you know, conversations I had recently was with one of the uh, global and they were asking questions from some 
how to develop a new platform uh, of six and 13. So now we're still talking about social media and 13 year olds. Very soon, we will talk about social media platforms for the six year old to the 12 year old. And at that point, I mean, we had conversations about privacy and other things that people need to know. But I'll repeat again, three important things. Number one, know the platforms you You cannot say I am old school. I don't understand your social media. I'm not saying use it. In fact, my suspicion is that if you have a global career, there's no way in the world you're not going to use social media uh, in your work at some point. So number one, understand the platform. Uh, number two, use it with them. Have conversations with them. Let them be able to trust you to come ask questions and say, oh, daddy, I saw this uh, on Twitter. I saw this on Snapchat. I saw this. Come and see. Or mommy, uh, what do you think about this? And the thought is guide them through how to use those platforms for good. If you've used it yourself for good purposes, it's going to be a very simple with my son or my daughter about social media because I use it uh, and I can show them how I've used it and how it has improved my life and also improved theirs. Yeah, Th thank you so much. V very grateful. Let me let me let me come to Mr. Luani. Um, now, while while Benga was talking, he was talking about how parents should actually lead the charge. And research has also shown that when parents lead the charge, um, teenagers tend to become more responsible. They use the social media more responsibly. But I'd like to come to you. Many parents tend to be passive in the year in their use of social media. How can they do that? I, can, I mean, how do you think a, a normal parent, because you know, some of them will tell them, ah, I don't know, I don't have a Snapchat account, I don't even know what Snapchat is, I don't know what Instagram is, I don't know what Facebook is. So, how do you think parents who do not have that kind of, let's like, say, light heart to learn, how can they still ensure that their children behave responsibly on the social, on, on the social media platforms? It's, it's advisable that parents should be interested in what their children do. And this does not start, like I said, everything about life starts from the beginning. You can't just come midway or mid-road and want to start um, um, and trying or do, um, ensure, making, making your children do what you want them to do in the middle of the road. Every, everything in life has stages. Now, if as a parent, if as a parent you have developed a relationship with your children. It will be easy for you, even though you don't know everything. I, I, I know that um, in this day and age, we grew up in a different age. They are growing up in a different environment right now. And um, not all parents know all the social media platforms. Not all. We can't even know all. So if, we, if we want to be realistic, um, depending on the, the, the kind of um, the kind of what we do and the rest we can't we can't have a, we can't do all but at least we have a general or or a general information about what is going on but one major thing is this if you keep your teenagers engaged if you get involved in what they do you will you will find it easy to relate with them um they may be they may be on a particular um, 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 social media platform that you you are not you are not there you don't even know about it but somehow when you you create that um, relationship with your children such that if they see anything they are free to come to you you won't judge them you won't preempt them you won't be like um, like an ostrich in their lives and how do I mean some parents you, you can be an ostrich in two ways is either you you leave them to themselves it is your own life just do whatever you like. Or you begin to poke nose into their life, and you know everything they are doing. You want to see, you know, if you don't do, if you don't, if you don't do that, and you are responsible, and you are, you know, you love them, they see that you truly care. They themselves will come to you. Um, I, I, I will give an example of my son. For me, I, 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 I don't, I don't pry into their lives. But um, about three weeks ago, he called me and said, "Ah, mommy, you are not even following my um, a particular um, um." Uh, social media and I'm like okay so you want me to follow you now and then I decided to start following you know it's it's it, we shouldn't we shouldn't um um be an ostrich we shouldn't we shouldn't um um give them you know give them the just give them the free 
the free um, um, will way to do what they want to do, but guided. We cannot, we cannot, um, we cannot do everything for them, but we can guide them. We can encourage them. We can, we can be intentional in how we will help them to to guide them into what they want to do. Like you said, when when teenagers are are with their parents. On, in the issue of social media, they tend to be responsible in the use of it. So the reality is that we parents, we have to also come up, learn about these things, and, um, and, and, and then also help them to, when they have questions, for instance, or they come to you with things that they see, or, think, or you can even hear that some, some children do certain things, and some people come to report, report to you that uh, this is what your child has done, blah, 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 blah. Instead of you in the child or the rest, give, give them room, you know, give them room to explain. Don't just judge them, don't just scream at them. All we need in the in this parents of, of this age, of this time, is for us to guide them. Recently, in um, doing this um, lockdown in our church where I, 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 I serve, we decided to create a forum for the teenagers. And I realized that I'm doing more work behind the scene. There's some, that some teenagers don't know how to how to respond to certain things on that platform. And you will see me going back, you know, privately to, to chat them up, to teach them. And then you see them coming back to apologize on, the, on their own, on the platform to say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I withdraw that statement, you know, things like that. So we, it, it's very true that parents help in, in, in making them to, to, um, to use the social media in a very productive manner. And, um, we, uh, the, the fact is that um, we parents, we need to engage them and be intentional in what we do, especially with these teenagers, so that we don't lose them totally. Let them be free to come to you. Let them be free that when they are here and they come to tell you things or you hear things about them, you don't judge them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance. I'd like to come to Binga. Um, now, while Ms. Yudhuani was talking, she was saying, uh, parents are not supposed to be ostriches. In other words, they don't, they don't necessarily have to be in the faces of their teenagers. But while you were also talking, you said um, there are parental control, that is like DSTV, where you can have parental control. Can you walk us through those, some of those, why you can actually monitor them without necessarily being in their faces? You know, why you can monitor what they do? For example, uh, the issue of some, some do sexting, um, cyber bullying, you know. So is there any way we can, do you have tools that parents can actually learn to actually know how to monitor them, what they do, you know, on the social media? Can you walk us through step by step? There may need the application that you can use. Can you just walk us through those, those uh, applications? Thank you. My pleasure. So, uh, so some of those things are lifelong conversations uh, that you've started. So I gave you an example earlier. My daughter is two. But even now, she's beginning to read, and one of the books that we've read with her is titled Don't Touch Me There. Now, because we have read that now, when she's five, we can have a conversation about, you know, cyberbullying, about harassment, about things like that. And when she gets on an online, online platform, it becomes easier. I don't have to monitor. I don't have to control and say, let me see, you know, bring your phone, let me see before you use it. Uh, when I was talking about parental controls, I was focusing a lot more on the new platforms that are now focusing on between six and 12. In fact, for those platforms, the kids cannot use anything without a parent giving approval. But once a child is 13 and they have a smartphone, you cannot be a hawk. You can't monitor everything uh, that they're doing. The reality is that at that point, you know how they say, uh, I'll say it in Yoruba and I will translate, right? It is what a bird eats that sustains it in flight. At that point, the one thing that can see them through how they use the platform are the conversations with, you know, with them, how you have moved uh, the use of technology with them, and how you have, of course, become a model to them generally in life so at that point what you can guide them through is not exactly parental controls of how to make sure they don't do things but show them on those platforms security settings so for example if a child uses um, a virtual call platform you will show them that your camera does not always have to be on because one of the problems we have during this lockdown uh, is the fact that because we're now all at home working from home school and things like that there are many conversations that are, that kids are beginning to have with their friends and if it's happening on a mobile device 
it becomes very easy for that child to take that mobile device and maybe run all over the house and literally give his or her friends a virtual tour of your house for free. Now, that isn't safe for many reasons. The same way you will not allow a stranger into your home and show them all of the room, your bedroom, your bathroom and everything, uh, your study, your the same way you won't do that for, you know, for strangers, the same way you shouldn't do that online. One of the lessons parents must also teach their children is online courtesy. You give what you expect because many times we talk about cyber bullying as if it is only the kids, only our kids that get bullied. Guess what? That cyber bullying happens among teenagers because some other kids are bullied. Those kids that are bullying also have parents. Many of those parents complain also about cyber bullying. We need our kids to give courtesy as they expect it. But apart from that, we need to also let them realize that when you get, and I think this is a critical one. In online environments, everybody is not who they say they are. Not everybody is who they say they are. It is possible for you to be on Facebook, have a friend who has common friends with you, and realize many years later that that person is not who they say they are. And I can give many examples. Uh, one of the popular uh, examples, uh, I mean, there are two popular examples that I, that I usually give to people. There's one called Royal Amable uh, that was on Twitter many years ago. Uh, this guy pretended to be a lady, befriended many people, and unfortunately got money from them, got a lot of emotional investment. And when people were about to find out, she somehow got someone to say that she had died. And of course, we found out later uh, after some investigation. And uh, was on Facebook, uh, you know, a guy who used to work for the president. Uh, I, you know, I, w I don't want to mention his name, but I've written a lot about this. He worked for the president as a as a, as a social media assistant. He created a name, Wendell Simlin, and he used it to interact with people, to create new friends, and at some point, even used it to try to implicate the CBN governor at the time, you know, SLS, uh, as the sponsor of Boko Haram and things like that. Uh, of course, you know, I did some research and I found out who the real person was uh, from some forensic work and things like that. But the point is parents must allow their kids to understand that bullying is a two-way street. There are times when there are kids that give the bullying. It should not be your child giving if it is your child at the receiving uh, end of the bullying, you need to have some, you know, conversations with them and let them know if someone has terrible behavior online, they can easily disconnect from such people. If anybody, after they've disconnected from them, still tries to get in touch, there are many tools like blocking, like muting, that can help them. Make sure that you work with them to create a safe environment. And I think at the top of all this is to let them realize that what they see online may not always be what it seems. Uh, I'm sure people have seen the picture of the guy who used his toilet seat and a you know paper wall to take a picture that looked like it was an it was in an airplane flying. Um, and so there are many scenarios like that where what you see is not what you get online. And it's important for so like I said, uh, for those below 13, of course you need to institute parental controls, but for those who are 13 who have the legal right to sign the conversations you've had with them, interactions, the modeling, because what, and everybody knows this, our kids do the things we do. Our kids kind of make us the yardstick, and if we do something, my five-year-old sees me doing something and says, Daddy, you said I should go up to sleep, and I go to sleep, and I saw you going downstairs, and you were not sleeping at that time. And we have to have a conversation, when you sleep at 7.30, as an adult, I can't sleep at 7.30. And then we had a conversation. So modeling is important. And it's the same thing online. It is not about playing the orc and hanging around them and trying to secretly follow them around various platforms. Because if you do, they will go dark. And when they go dark, it will be worse. Thank you. I'm going to stay with you, Binga. I'm going to stay with you on that. Now, when you were talking, you, 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 know, you know, in passing, you, you, you actually said that the age probably the, so, so many of these social media platforms, the age is, recommended age is actually 13 years. But I also think that from experience, children are different. There are those who are 10 who are as mature as a 15 year old, and there are those who are 15 who are not as mature as a 20 year old. So I, I'd like to ask you, 
Um, what what do you think should be the parental prerogative? I mean, when they should actually allow their children to go to go use the social media? Is it going to be 13 as recommended or prescribed? So I want, I want to know: Is it going to be a situation where the parents actually think that? Oh, my, my my son is my son is 13, but I don't think he's mature enough to handle the social media. I rather wait till about 15. So what do you say to that? So every leader knows that one of the best ways to convince people to do something is to make them believe they made decisions by themselves. Um, and, and so I think it's important not to say you are not ready, but to allow them to come to the conclusion that they are not ready. And there are many ways to do this. Uh, the 13 year rule is not universal. Like you said, there are many 13 year olds that have the cognitive abilities of 31 year olds. And there are many 31 year olds on Twitter today who you read what they write and see how they behave and you can tell that they are still stuck in their GS1 in secondary school, in their thinking and their behavior. So you need to domesticate that conversation in your own home. When they are young, I mean, when they're five, when they're two, the kind of books you expose them to, the kind of jokes that you play, the kind of things you allow them to see are the things that lay the foundation you have with them when they are 10. My son says to me, oh, I need my own phone. He's five. And I say to him, you can't have your own phone now. And because he's five, it's easy for us to have a conversation and explain to him using the characters in his book to convince him that he's not ready for it. But once he goes up to the age of nine and 10 and 11, and don't forget, that's where peer pressure sets in. And he sees all his friends have two phones. The way to test whether you are is this if your son or your daughter come back home and say all oh, my friends have phones i want one now there may be trouble but if they come back home and they're laughing and saying things like oh all my friends mm -hmm. have phones daddy is it that their parents have not told them that they are not ready then you can tell that the conversations you've had the modeling you've done has worked and and by the way this is not this is not cast in stone it doesn't mean that when they are now suddenly 11 you now say okay when you are 13, you are going to get a smartphone. But my point is, from when they are toddlers, the kind of toys we get for our children. For example, uh, when, when we gave birth to our first child, my son, we deliberately decided not to get him the typical boy toys. You know, people will wonder, why are you getting him Aisha that is a dog? Or are you trying to make... Listen, the things you model are the things that determine what they want to do when they grow up. We chose not to get him things that could get him towards violence, but to expose him to the entire gamut of how you play as a child. And I think it's important that we know that these things that we do when they are two, when they are five, when they are eight, when they are 11, is what then leaves them to have a conversation with friends when they are 13 and then come and decide, I want my own phone or you know put phones on their pillows and begin to do things. This conversation does not happen when they are 13. And as I said, it is important to know that that 13 is the rule for the platform, not the rule for your home. The privacy policy of your own home does not have to be the same thing with the privacy policy of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube. You must define in your own home what the rules are. And these rules, like I said at the first, you know, the first thing I said is every leader knows this. You don't set a rule and say this is the rule for everyone. No, you consult. You make people understand the process and you lead them towards the path of making the decisions. In fact, uh, one of the things they say about leaders is that at some point, leaders can easily manipulate. They can make you do the things that they want you to do and make you think that you were the one to decide to do it. I'm not asking for money. And let us get to a point where these people are able to see their friends do these things. Uh, and don't forget, the rule is internal must always be greater than external. There will be pressure. There will be pressure from the outside. But the forces on the inside, the values that you subscribe to, the norms that you've agreed on, the things that you've agreed as a home and as a family, that these are the things that we do and this is why we do them, they must be greater than the forces of peer pressure that your children will face at 10 when all their friends begin to carry phones around and say, ah, I'm on TikTok and I pretended to be 15, but I'm still 10. You can't start when they're 10. You can't start when they're 13. You must start from the day our kids were born. We started reading to them. Of course, even before then, you know, the joke about reading to your wife's stomach so that a child you know, can hear it. And it is not a surprise 
that at the age of two, we were looking for my daughter yesterday. It took a few seconds and we couldn't, we were wondering where she was. I went upstairs and I saw her two levels up, sitting by herself, holding a book and saying, lion, lion, identifying the lion inside. It is what we train them with that would help us define the kind of conversation we can have with them later and will help with the external pressure. Thank you so much. Ms. Kumani. Okay, fantastic. So I'm, I'm just going to ask you, uh, the social media is a very powerful tool uh, for influencing the teens. And I'm talking, I'm talking especially our musicians like uh, Davido, uh, um, Whiskey, and later, and, 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 and with more recently, Naira Mali. How do you think parents can actually, as it were, um, fend off these influences of the social media? When I draw and say fend off, how do you think you can protect them? Because the truth of matter, whether you like it or not, like when you rightly mentioned, they're going to be on the social media. But how do you think parents can actually guard their, 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 their teens from the, influence, from the negative influence of their role models, like Davido, like um, Naira Mali? I mean, uh, it was it was um, a, a couple of days ago. Was in the news that he went to Abuja, and you know, I mean, very not not the, not a very good story. But these are the role models of our children. So, how do you think parents can help their children in this in this in this terrain? Um, I will tell you that um, we are talking about Naira Mali. You talk about um, the video. We also have we also have some fantastic people out there. So. We shouldn't just look at social media as a, as, as a bad tool or, 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 or something that makes you to look at bad things or things that are not really edifying. Social media on its own is a neutral tool. It depends on how, how we deploy it, you know, how we use it. Now, uh, one major thing is that for every family and every, uh, every, every, every family setting, you should have... It, it, you should have a set of values that you, you push out there. Like I said earlier, you can't be in CBCC, for instance, and some words will not keep haunting you. You, read, you, you will win by righteousness, um, integrity, excellence, purpose, you know. All those things will, begin, will continue to haunt you one way or the other. That you will begin to see that um, there are some things you can't just do. And that is why we say you don't legislate behavior. You don't legislate um, um, how a child should be. You develop, you cultivate, you have talks. The, the, in life, we have to keep on talking and talking with these children. For instance, um, if we look at the, the word of God, Joseph was 17 years when he left the house and never returned to that house. And the things that saw him through in the land of Egypt where he was, was all that he had learned from when he was home. Interestingly, my own children left the house also at 17. Now, they are there. And I, and I, I, I used to tell them then, and look, this is what happened to Joseph. And look at all the things that happened to him along the line. A lot of distractions. Even there was no social media, but there was, there was, there was, there was, there um, was, um, set, there was he, he could he could he could steal from his from his master and he could he could be wicked to his master but no he didn't do that he, he he maintained his integrity all through his lifetime before he even became um, a prime minister in Egypt now yes there are a lot of things on social media but it is how we use it what have you trained your children with what values have you put in them you know in my house in those days when they were young there's some cartoons they cannot watch. We sit down to watch cartoons together. If a parent does that, you know, and as you are watching it, you are asking them questions. What do you think? What do you think? And they give you an answer. You will know, you'll be able to say that, okay, fine, you've done your bit. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to put a, a, a put or legislate anything for anyone. But like in my house, at, at that time when they were young, when you put Scooby-Doo, my children will say, no, I'm not watching Scooby-Doo because... I don't like what I'm seeing in Scooby-Doo, for instance. And they don't watch it. So the same thing, if they, put, um, if, if, if they put something wrong or something that does not match your value in front of you, you won't buy it. You won't like it. You, won't, you, may, you may watch it quite all right. There's a lot of things that come to your phone unsolicited anyway. 
And you, 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 you want it to see, but does not mean that it will affect who you are. So the major thing every time is that we as parents, we need to continue to communicate our family values, what we believe, and leave that thing as well in their faces. That our children will know that, okay, this, my mommy says this, my daddy says this, and he does it. That is also very key. And let's now assume that, oh, they want to do it. Because it, it, there was a time that we had to, one of my children said he wants to go for a concert. And my other was like, yeah, let them go. Let's go. When he went there, for the, for the David o concert some years back, when he went there, he himself came and said, ah, I don't, I, I don't like it. No, 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 no. That's not what I expected. You know, they see something else. And by the time they get on social media, by the time they get to that place, they realize that, that they are not, they are not want, you know, they can't even cope. So as, as parents, we need to continually communicate. We need to continually talk and also live that life, you know, in front of them. Um, you know, they, they say they like, they like something, they follow something. When you, you like what you get value from, you follow what you get value from. So your children will follow you when they see what you do. When, you know, when you have certain um, situations on, on, on ground and this is the way you approach it, they look at it, oh, they learn from that. So uh, even though there are a lot of a lot of vices there on social media, you know, that our, our, our children our children are exposed to, but what what is built in them is what is going to see them through in this in this um, age that we are in. And that is why we cannot stop talking. We cannot stop talking. Not just talking nonsense, but talking values, talking the word, talk and living that word in their faces. Thank you. thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to ask any of the audience, um, I just want to go to the audience very briefly before I come to Binga. I'd just want to ask the audience, if you have any question, can you just signify by raising your hand? If you have any question for Binga, for either Binga or Uluani, can you just raise your hand? I just want to see you. I'd like to see if you're there. If you have any question at all that you want to ask Binga or Ms. Uluani, you can signify by raising your hand. Yes. Yes. Yeah, can you ask your question? Yes, I can. I can hear you. I wanted to ask Mr. Benga a question. Okay, can you, can you a you? question? Okay, fantastic. Okay. But there's something. Yeah, Mr. Benga, it's a pleasure to have you on on the platform today. Thank you, sir. Um, when you when you were listening listing the things you should know when dealing as far as the social uh, platform medias that our teenagers interact with, you talk about you knowing it yourself, you using it with yeah. them. I think I missed the third one. You mentioned three, but okay. I could actually itemize two. Okay, thankfully I remember. Uh, the third, <laughs> the first one is knowing it yourself. The second is using with them, and the third is guiding them to understand the purpose of the use of that platform. Uh, because people use platforms for various reasons. Some of some of the platforms are for obvious reasons. So LinkedIn is a career platform, but some others like Facebook and Twitter are used differently by different people. So it is important for you to work with them to guide how to use it. I use Twitter in my work to communicate the work we do, to have conversations, and to attract the sources and partners. Some other people use it just, you know, and nothing else. I use it for fun and for those things. So it's important to guide them to what they can use. They can use Twitter to connect with mentors, with opportunities. They can use Twitter to search for information. I mean, as things, they are at the point where uh, they're considering, you know, their first fellowship opportunity, internship opportunities or even maybe the first at that point those are the things that you use platforms for and you can connect them the basic idea is a plus b equals c a is the teenager b is the platform c is their desired destination in life the teenager uses the platform to get to their desired destination in life thank you mr Kyodin. do you have any other any other any other uh, question 
Before I ask the last question, somebody said, this is Oyebola said, we need to revisit our, just I don't want to comment on the chat here. Yeah? We need to, Mr. Oyebola uh, said that we need to revisit our social, our societal values by giving our children a strong foundation to build on. Parents must prepare their worlds as they grow up, which will help them make good decisions. And also Vincent said, okay, and there's also Omotola Ahamioji. He said, we found the speakers. My question is, uh, does we have situations? I hope Mr. Uh, Mr. Gwenga Shaso and uh, Ms. Oluwani are listening. So we think yeah. we thank the speakers. My question is, um, is this does we have situations where parents have missed it while the children were growing up? Uh, now in their children's teenage years, could you advise how this can be corrected? Uh, I think Mr. Mrs. Oluwani should go first, then I'll come to Gwenga. Okay. First of all, we're children of God, and there's no, no situation that is um, difficult for God. We need to continue to pray. We can't stop praying for these children, and we can't stop talking. We can't stop praying. We can't stop talking. Yes, it looks like they have missed it, but God has a way of, of, um, of, of bringing us back to where he wants us to be because he has a purpose for everyone. And like we said, your values are already, already there, you, that, that you yourself also live. You, let the children see you, that you are changing certain things. Let the children see you too. Yes, you know that you have missed it. If you come and tell them, look, I've, I've done something wrong. I think I'm not right in this area. I think I've, I've, you know, just own up. They will also see that as well. But the truth is that we cannot stop praying for these children. Yes, it seems that they have missed it, but at the same time, God has a purpose for them, and we cannot. Uh, I mean, they will, they will fulfill that purpose, and we can. We shouldn't just. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be worried. You know, um, um, God, God, God is there. He will not allow them to fail, and He will not allow us to fail. As long as we ourselves have decided to live right, we begin to see it translate in the lives of our children as well, by 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 His grace. So that is um, what I would say on that. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Can you just respond to that? If 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 you are missing the parents while your children are going up, is there any remedy? Is there any remedy? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, so it's, it's not even just around the issues of social media and all that. There's always, I mean, there's a reason we talk about remedy. Remedy is, is you know, is, is a fact of life. Uh, I, I think that a few things. So I do a lot of training with young people and the people I work with are people who typically did not have a lot of parental intervention growing up. And I think that two elements that help a lot. Number one is modeling showing them the alternative. So this is what you have learned. Show them the alternative. What is the alternative? What will they get into? I mean, what will where the, the path they are on? What will they, what will, where will they land them? And then what is the alternative to be able to talk about cost correction? But the second, and I think the, even the more important one, is positive peer pressure. Now, if and, and, and I, I I saw this happen in secondary school and I had no idea what was going on. A parent brought a child to our school, federal government college, do anything then, and said, uh, a teacher just called me and said, Oh, so one parent wants to see you, and then said, This guy is now your friend. Make sure he becomes as brilliant as you, make sure he becomes a good boy like you. I had no idea what was going on, but guess what? It worked to a certain extent. Now, this is the same thing that I do in my work. I allow young people who we think are going on the wrong path to become friends with young people who are on the right path. And when they see the pressure, when they feel the pressure of good, just the same way they succumb to negative peer pressure, I have seen young people succumb to positive peer pressure. So we need to model, uh, connect them with the alternative path and show them what's possible. It could be through reading, it could be through showing them uh, role models that they can connect with. It could even be using the same platforms they're on to allow them to see. show them on the same platforms, the people that have taken different paths and where they end up and positive peer pressure. Thank you, thank you very much. We're very grateful. Um, before we round off, let me just, um, read out some of our, like a summary of what our discussion. Number one is that teenage years are time for establishing 
your identity, that if you're a teenager, that's where, where, that's where teenagers establish their identity. Number two is that you need to parents need to understand the platforms their children are on. Number three is that they used to use the social media with them, but the parents need to use the social media platforms with them and guide them to understand the purpose. Number four is parents should be interested in what interests their teens. Number five, a parent must continue to have a continuous conversation and engagement with their teenagers. Number six, the society, the social media is not bad in itself, it's the way we use them. And number seven is parents must continue to communicate their family values to their children or their parents or their teens. And number eight, modeling is very important in influencing the teenagers. Well, I'd like to thank Mr. Binga Shesson for coming on Greater Walks and also Mrs. Victoria Luani. And um, I'd like to also recognize so many other people who came. We call out Oyeti Mei, Ade Akikunle, Akiode, Tat. I guess that's the, that's a name on social media. Omotola Ahimioje, Binga, Omotosho, Muyosori Do, Olawale Uweye, Abiola Lasende, Ulu Binga, Uluani, Uluashiu, Olajide. Thank you again, Mr. Benga Chesson and Ms., uh, Mrs. Victoria Luani. It's been nice having you. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having you some other times. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure. Mr. Benga, your last word. My last word is teenagers must be deliberate. Um, so I'm looking, I'm, I'm in my study and I can look up uh, and I can see the diaries I've been keeping since 1995 until I stopped using physical diaries. You have to be deliberate. If you don't plan your future, you will get whatever the future offers. But if you plan it, you will get what you want. In those diaries, I wrote my future out. And I'm glad that I'm working progress, but at least excited and happy to do the things I do right now. If you're a teenager and you get a chance to listen to this, be deliberate. Have all the fun you want to have, be the teenager that you are, but be deliberate. So that tomorrow, when others are complaining and regretting, you can be excited to look back and also look forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Shazam. Thank you so much, our, our, our wonderful participant from all over the world. We're going to draw the curtain here. We look forward to having you next week. God bless you.